Thank you very much, Alan, and thanks to all of you for that uh, very warm welcome. We're delighted to, uh, to host David, as you heard there. And the way we're going to do it is that David and I will talk here for a bit, and we will then open it out and uh, hear... Well, I was going to say uh, questions and, of course, contributions, but you don't need to tell a Jewish audience that anyway because they will offer their own contributions, monologues, the, um, you know, expositions without any incitement or encouragement from me. So we don't need to urge them to do that. Um, we will, we've, we're gonna, we've got the hour, and we're going to um, really get off straight away, uh, get started straight away. And David, not only is this obviously the right time for us to be talking, because there are big things going on in the world, but for you, this is also the right place. Tell us about that. Yeah, I feel, um, is the mic working OK? <laughs> Feel slightly over amplified. Yeah. Can we do something about the mic? It f sounds a bit boomy. Is that, is that any better? Yes. Yeah. So I don't know about you, but when I uh, came up here this evening, um, I felt uh, I was coming to the building on Limington Road, not the building on Finchley Road, because Limington Road is the side road uh, on which uh, this building uh, uh, is placed. And at number four, Limington Road, from the mid to late 1950s until uh, about 1965, 66, 67, my grandparents ran a small shop where my grandmother sold hats and my grandfather, who was a uh, leather worker, sold little wallets. And so it feels very appropriate to be coming to a building on Limington Road, although I'm sure everyone else <laughs> describes it as the building on the Finchley Road. That's but interesting. I feel, oh, wow, that is loud. Um, I feel we know a lot about your parents' story, but not so much about your grandparents' story. So just tell no, us a so bit my, about um, No, my, so uh, it's an extraordinary story in some ways, in that both my, well, this is on my dad's side, so my um, my. Uh, two uh, grandparents were both born in Poland. Uh, they both um, emigrated to Belgium in 1918. Um, they got married with this ring, actually, in 1920 mm -hmm. um, in Brussels. And then uh, there was this extraordinary uh, hiatus, obviously, in that in 1940, my father and my grandfather mm -hmm. uh, went to Ostend when the Germans went into Belgium and then came to London. Um, my dad was 16 at the time. He went to Acton Technical College, learned English, uh, graduated, uh, got into the LSE a year later. Um, and my grandmother and her, um, uh, and her daughter, my aunt, my late aunt, uh, spent the war in Belgium, uh, extraordinarily um, protected after 1942 by a Catholic family south of uh, Brussels. And just, I won't go on about this, but just to show you how things go around, I've got these letters at home. Because in 1945, my dad stayed as a student at the LSE. Um, he became a student of Harold Lasky. My grandfather went back to find his wife and daughter in Belgium. They did. And my dad asked Harold Lasky to uh, approach the Home Secretary at the time, the Labour Home Secretary, Chuta Reed, to ask for his mother and grandfather and sister to be allowed to come to the UK. And I've got these letters where Harold Lasky writes, my dear tutor. Harold Lasky was chairman of the Labour Party at the time. And my dear tutor, I've got this... And tutor, um, a Labour MP. Tutor, Labour MP, Labour Home Secretary. Uh, I've got this lovely student, Ralph Moorman, he's an undergraduate, he's, gonna, he's been in the Royal Navy for three years, and he wants his father and uh, mother and sister to come and join him in the UK. And tutor Reed replies saying, my dear Harold, I totally understand why you wanted them to come, but I'm afraid we're full, and they can't come. And there's a correspondence, because then Harold Lasky went back asking again in 1947, 48, and the, in a way there's a happy ending. In the, in the 1950s, under a Tory government, ironically, the... Uh, um, the, uh, uh, the um, Grandparents were allowed in, and my sister was allowed in. But the purpose of telling the story is the following. Tutor Ede was the MP for South Shields. And 50 years later, I became the MP for South Shields. So... I know that story because that was in your maiden story. speech, I think. It was. In the yeah. House of Commons. Yeah. And I'm so much of a nerd that I know what was in your maiden speech. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're a very uh, fine judge. In, 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 I think, in, in 2001, I think yeah. there would have been, yeah. So, but it, there's a kind of poetic justice that the grandson of the man denied by the MP for 
uh, South Shields becomes the member. Of the yeah, but, but by the way, not de not denied on any capricious grounds. No. I mean, to be fair, uh, I've been asked this actually in uh, political settings. Well, was it wrong? Was it wrong what Tudor Reid mm. did? And of course, it's impossible to say. Well, mm. he should have allowed this family in because their son was the student of the chairman of the right. Labour Party, because what Tudor Reid was doing as Home Secretary was running a system which had a certain number of Jews from continental Europe allowed in. So it's kind of an, yes. it, 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 it's, it, I, don't want to, I don't want to misrepresent the, uh, what, what Tudor Reid was doing. Well, it's interesting you've taken us back to that period in a way, because the convulsions of the last week and of the last six months have had people making you know, slightly doom-laden and gloomy uh, comparisons or evocations, anyway, of that period, and just wondering if we're going through a period of similar, uh, certainly instability, but also kind of angst. So let's just kick off, because you are now based in New York, with the question that is the one that comes up, actually, even just in conversation, informally, the, on the bus and at the water cooler, which is, you know, last week's election... What's that about? I mean, what actually, you know, you're, you're, you're somebody who's participated in elections, but you're also a very astute observer of them. What's your reading of, of what happened in that election? Because it did seem to confound most people who had any expectations, including, incidentally, people in the Hillary Clinton campaign, but also in the Donald Trump campaign. They didn't think they were going to win. Mm. So what's your reading of what happened? Well, I think the temptation is always to focus on the tactical and the contingent. So how did the team with the best polling not realize that they were running behind in Wisconsin and Michigan? Why didn't they put any advertising in there? Um, what about the Comey letter, et cetera? I think that would be a mistake because there are structural factors at play, which I think become evident not just if you study the US result, uh, but also if you look at Brexit, if you look at the state of politics in Western Europe uh, overall. And I think uh, from my, I mean, by the way, high degree of humility, I didn't predict the Trump victory, nor did I predict Brexit. So you can discount the rest of what I say. If, uh, I mean, by the, and I promise Mrs. Le Pen won't win. No, I mean, I, one can't, you can't say that. That's the, yeah, I remember having With your track record, we don't want you exactly, to say that. Exactly. Uh, uh, I, I remember having a conversation a year ago saying, look, there's lots of 20% chances. Yeah. A 20% chance of Brexit, a 20% chance of Trump, a 20% chance of Le Pen. Eventually, one of them will come off, and now two of them have come off. And of course, the fact that two have already come off doesn't mean it's any less likely yes. that the Le Pen uh, thing comes off. So we should take that seriously. I, I think the obvious thing is that divisions in Western advanced industrialized societies, economic divisions are over income and wealth and opportunity, social divisions about changing social mores, about changing role of women in society, about immigration, um, political assumptions about the relationship between the governors and the governed, those divisions across the economic, social, and political mm. axes, those divisions have, divisions have widened in the last 20 years. And the problem with saying that is that, well, you could make the same argument that over the last 100 years there have been times of enormous division, but not such sustained and severe challenge to centre-left and centre-right parties. Because what I see going on at the moment is that centre-left and centre-right parties are under enormous challenge. Uh, the answers that we as, uh, me as a social democrat, that others as Christian democrats were providing are under sustained populist challenge from the hard left and the hard right. And so there are two fa other factors going on, I think, that uh, explain why these divisions have become fissures that lead to convulsion in politics. One is that is this age of radical transparency. Uh, there's nothing that's secret anymore. Everything comes out. Uh, it comes out as a lie before it comes out as a fact, often. It's circulated. Uh, the, the old saw that the, the lie is halfway around the world before the truth gets its boots on is more, more true than, uh, than ever. Um, everyone can be a journalist. Every citizen can be a journalist. Uh, the, the, the age of radical transparency, I think, has exposed these divisions in a very profound way and resentful way. But the, the second additional factor, which I think is different, is that we are living in the first age of a truly global connected market economy. And there is therefore a clear driver of what's going on and in some people's eyes a clear culprit. Mm. And I think that if you put, if you want to explain how have these divisions become fissures, I think you have to look at this age of radical transparency, but also this age of 
uh, globalization. Which well, has... Just on the radical transparency thing, in the American election, it seemed lopsided because, yes, every email she'd ever written or any of her team had ever written, that was out there in public. You, know, you could see her sort of laundry list and her, you know, her messages about yoga practice. That was all there. Not on the Donald Trump side. We never saw his tax returns. We never did hear what he said, you know, apparently off, on a, on, uh, off mic, as it were, the recordings of The Apprentice. All that stuff stayed here. Well, but you did It was see, lopsided I mean, radical you, transparency. You saw quite a lot of his tax returns. I mean, you saw enough of his tax returns for two-thirds of the American public to have their own view about what those tax returns Well, for one year, meant. 20 years ago, that's all we saw. Yeah, but it... It was very revealing. It, I think it told quite a large story to people. Now, um, I think that... The point is that you've got this, on the one, maybe it's that on the one hand you've got the transparency, query whether or not it's um, asymmetrical. Yes. Uh, and of course you've got the WikiLeaks business, you've also got the Russian hacking going on, but also this uh, sense of civilian surge, civilian empowerment mm. that says I'm going to get my own back and I can get what I want in the market economy and I want to get what I want in politics as well. And, that the, and this notion that there's a conspiracy against the common man I think has been exacerbated by the half-truths that have come out. Maybe that's the way of putting it. Yeah. And you did link it to Brexit. Do you see, I mean, how similar are the dynamics in both these two? Things? Well, I think that if you look at the voting blocks, there's something significant going on, which is uh, that significant numbers of voters who've traditionally voted Democratic or traditionally voted um, Labour have deviated from the... Uh, party allegiance. Um, but it's not, only, it's not only that. I think that uh, it's striking to me that in the US context, 90% of Republicans voted for Donald Trump, only 89% of Democrats voted for Hillary Clinton. So, uh, and the, I think I'm right in saying the average income of the Trump supporter was $72,000 a year. Um, he, he got support across the income uh, spectrum. And so I think there are some parallels. I think that the most significant thing that I think people like me have to take on board is that I, I was brought up to believe that in politics, if, you, if your party was the greatest risk, then you were going to lose. Hmm. And if you think about Labour in 92, uh, a fundamental reason we lost was that people thought we were a risk. What happened in the Brexit referendum and in the US election last week is that the desire for change trumped, sorry, the desire, <laughs> the desire for change overrode the fear of the risk. Because I think in both cases, without being, I mean, I'm obviously a partisan, but without um, a partisan hat on, you could say that the vote for Brexit and the vote for Donald Trump were both the higher risk options. Yes. Uh, but in both cases, the anger at the status quo was enough to overcome the fear of the, the risk of the change. And someone said to me today at a lunch I was doing, they said, well, what is it about globalization that is causing this? And in a way, it's quite simple. Not enough people have a stake in, quote unquote, the system. So if you don't have a stake in the system, you're ready to kick over the system, whatever the risk. And the sense you've and lost out because your wages have stagnated or shrunk over the years and you're, you, you want yeah, to I think that the I think job in any of it. One's got to be careful not to be a too economic determinist about it. I think there is an economic element. I think the social element is important, and I think the political sense of disempowerment from politics is important as well. And the, the truth about the last 20 years is that it's extraordinarily expanded global wealth. It's extraordinarily uh, helped people out of poverty but it, it, in the uh, developing world. But in the industrialized world, it's been associated with massive inequality, massive instability, and globally, uh, unsustainability. And the three great, the three tragic horsemen of globalization are inequality, unsustainability and instability. And those, uh, that's what's leading to this process of what people are fearing is deglobalization. I, I want to talk about the Jewish aspect of it in one second. But before we do that, just on a personal level, you had worked closely with Hillary Clinton when you were foreign secretary and she was uh, secretary of state. What has the world and what has America lost by her not being president? That's, I think, a good way of asking it. Um, I think that someone who was... There was a, I think the best phrase to sum her up is that she, however incrementalist she became, she was always an idealist. And it's this, um, you don't think of idealists being incrementalist, but she lived in the inches that the extra child health program lived in. She lived in the inches that the rise in the minimum wage 
lived in. She lived in the inches above all that the empowerment of women is won by. And I mean, I'll be careful how I say this because it's obviously a public event and we are a uh, non-partisan charity. We work with transition teams from both sides. But obviously, I held a uh, staff meeting last Wednesday. And without saying what was the overall voting intention, although Manhattan voted 87% for Clinton, the, uh, I do think that one thing to understand when you say what has been lost, the sense of um, hurt and grief, actually, mm. among women who had been devoted to Hillary's election really struck me in that room. It really struck me. It wasn't just that Democrats were very upset that they'd lost. There was a sense that uh, it's taken so long for a woman candidate to be nominated. Mm. And by anyone's um, judgment or uh, metrics, a, a very qualified woman. And that sense of will that glass ceiling, you know, is that glass ceiling thicker than we thought, I think feels very, very mm. And yet the strange strong. thing was, you know, he not only got 63% of white men, he got 52% of why women. Yeah. Women didn't rally to her in the end. That's absolutely right. Absolutely right. But you're asking me what's lost. Yeah. I think that the uh, when one's judging what's lost, it's not just what did she represent and what could she have done as president in an unstable world, because I think this is a very unstable world and it's a time for steady and stable leadership. I think there's a whole group of the population who, for whom very deep questions are now arising about their own countrymen and women. Mm. And it's very interesting, your phrase there, steady and stable leadership, that was a turn off to many voters. I mean, just your point before about risk. You know, in the past, just saying that would have been enough. And this time, actually, the people didn't want steady or stable. They wanted to kick it over. Yeah. Um, the Jewish aspect of this interests me, which is, you know, you're now there in New York, in some ways, you know, the most Jewish city in the world. And uh, for many years, the dynamic when between a British Jew and, a, and an American Jew would be that they would say, I mean, I know cases of this where the American Jew would greet the British Jew by, going, by saying, you know, well, good for you. It's very brave of you to carry on living there uh, in London. You know, my grandmother remembers the pogroms, and that, that's obviously what you're going through. And, uh, you know, it, it must be like 1938. There was this sort of... I mean, so, uh, so a journalist today used the word condescension about it, this sense that somehow Europe was in the grip of just hideous 1930s-style anti-Semitism, and America was immune uh, and comfortable, and yet now here's this situation where um, Donald Trump's senior counsellor, Steve Bannon, has, you know, the founder of this Breitbart website, uh, with a very uh, problematic record on all kinds of minorities, including Jews. But Donald Trump himself, in his campaign, you know, using very uh, age-old uh, tropes uh, of anti-Semitism. Is there, you talked to describe the, the room that you were in on the Wednesday morning. What are you picking up from, you know, Jews in New York, and do you feel there is a sort of chill in the air as a result of this election? I, I don't feel that yet. And it's important that, yeah. to, to add the last word, it would be, be wrong to, to say that. I mean. Obviously, New York was, Manhattan especially, was very, I mean, Staten Island, by the way, was very significantly for Trump, almost as much for Trump as Manhattan was for, uh, uh, as Manhattan was for Clinton. Um, so, no, but I think that the, uh, for, for me, one of the great things about globalization is that, is, is the celebration of how uh, diversity makes us whole. And uh, Bill Clinton actually used to say, we're 99% the same, but we spend all our time talking about the 1% that's different. And I think that uh, that is clearly not a view uh, celebrated by not insignificant numbers of people. I don't think one should exaggerate it, but I think it's very important not to be complacent about anti-Semitism in Europe. It's important not to be complacent about it in uh, the US. It's important not to be complacent about it anywhere. Um, but it's also important to recognize that uh, one has to, uh, since neither of us are Americans, so we'll be careful how we say this, but we're coming off the back of the, of the first black president of the United States. Um, we're coming off a period in which the growth of the Latino population has mm -hmm. been very significant. And there's no doubt that the degree of cultural change that's in turn that's happening in American society 
is changing that society. And for some people, that is very uh, unnerving. Yes. Um, we, we're going to talk about refugees in a moment, and it's important. But there was one thing you said earlier, which I, I, I just want to pick up on. You talk about the challenges to the centre-left and the centre-right, almost as if the centre-left and centre-right find themselves in the same boat now as the sort of mainstream parties. And a few people I've heard it in conversation since Brexit happened said, have said to me, you know, if there was a party that was, I don't know, Nick Clegg, George Osborne, David Miliband, well, I would vote for that party. And what they mean by that, I think, is there is this sort of, you know, and people's allegiances, um, well, we can hear what you think of that, what they mean by that, in a moment. But there, there's also quite interesting data that says that people's commitment to leave or, or remain as an identity is already bigger than their allegiance to Labour or Conservative, that they, they feel that that really identifies them. And so what I'm, I suppose, driving at is, is there now a sort of open politics and of closed politics, a sort of remain versus leave, it would be here, that almost is more important than the party affiliation uh, that, you know, that you would have been a very big part of a couple, you know, two or three years ago? And have we moved into some That's, other kind I mean, of alliance? It's interesting, is it? Because the, for, for someone who's a Labour member and supporter, we've had our own traumas about our pro-Europeanism. 30 years ago, we were an anti-European yeah. party. And Might be again now with the new leader. No, I, I think that the, um, the Labour tragedy is, is not that we're, gonna, we're an anti-European party. Labour's tragedy is that it, became, it, 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 it didn't care enough about Europe to persuade its own supporters about Europe. The Tory tragedy was that they became obsessed with Europe. Labour's tragedy was too complacent about Europe. Hmm. And... Um, None of us are innocent in this. I was a member of a government that was steadfastly and significantly and um, repeatedly deepening Britain's engagement in Europe in a way that actually changed Europe as well as, I would argue, improved Britain. Mm -hmm. But I was also part of a government that saw steady decline in support for the Britain's membership of the European Union while we were making Europe more beneficial for Britain, which is a very... Uh, disconcerting situation. Now, it's also true that the uh, respect and support for the European Union declined in more or less the same proportion as respect and support for the Westminster Parliament. So it, it's important to try and to... Um, but let me just get back to your point about the centre-left and the centre-right, because I think that the common route for the challenge to both... Jonathan's looking at his watch. I hope you're all set for, I mean, 11.30, no, 12 o'clock. We're just getting we're going here. But the... Uh, the um, you got them a Labour's tragedy. Though. Yeah, so uh, the, um, the, the challenge for the left, the centre-left, I think, is to show that a social democratic commitment to globalisation in various forms, managed and shaped in all sorts of ways, but is compatible with limits on inequality. That's essentially the dilemma. Can you have the fruits of globalization without the perils of inequality? The challenge for the right has the same root in globalization, which is can you sustain a center-right set of social mores while embracing a global economy? And globalization poses a dilemma for the Jeb Bushes of this world in the same way that it poses a dilemma for the Hillary Clintons of this world. And at the moment, you're seeing that the wind is in the sails of those who are to the outside flanks of those... Yes. Players. And there is a policy issue here, but there's also a political issue. And that's your point, that if the, uh, successful parties are never made, uh, they're led by politicians, but they don't start with politicians. They start with social movements. So the interesting thing is the, is not just the 48%, but the 52% who are concerned about whether or not we'll end up with a, a hard and bad Brexit rather than a manageable and tolerable Brexit. Yes. I, I, I take the point about the wind in the sails thing, but the upshot of that must be, isn't it, that when you look at Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell on the one hand and, say, Nick Clegg on the other, in terms of the issues you're talking about, globalisation, you, you must feel you have more in common with him than you do with them. Yeah, but that, you're, you're inviting me in <laughs> brilliantly... Uh, in brilliantly... Um, it's not quite Paxman. It's more sort of um, David Frostish way, uh, the late David Frostish way, to sort of uh, tread on some... Um, I love some landmines, and although I've been out of the game for three years, I'm not, I wasn't born yesterday. So the, uh, um, but I do think that uh, it's, the, the, people can hate many things about politics, and one thing is if people in different parties agree with each other when they pretend that they disagree with each other, and that would be 
the wrong thing uh, to do. Um, I think that the real challenge, though, is to figure out how to bridge this gap between politics and the people, if you like, or the governors and the governed. And one of the things that I'm really proud of after 2010 is that we created the Movement for Change, which spent five years uh, effectively creating Britain's first community organizing movement. You actually came in August 2010 to the convention that we had at the Methodist Central Hall, which was about a political party saying it existed to sponsor social change in communities, not just to get people to vote for it. And across Britain, actually, over the subsequent five years, we did something in micro scale that I think had the germs of a really empowering and engaging social movement. And uh, th that's important because if you don't build from the ground up, then you're going to you're going to topple over. So to get to the question of people and moving around the world, which is going is going to be very important for, uh, for the next part of our conversation, I, I'm just struck by what you said about Tutor Ede in a way, and how you find it hard to judge him now looking back because there was a system and you had to implement it. Did uh, part so much fueling this current angst is about immigration in both countries? And the government you were part of did preside over this period of big inward migration from the rest of the European Union uh, into, uh, in the sense of the uh, you know, newer members uh, in 2004 and five. Do you now look back on that and think the way that was managed was a mistake? That actually, you know, either that you, the government should have asked for transitional arrangements, you yeah, need no, to I've explain said, it look, better. What do you think about it? Obviously, yes. But the, let, let's transition to, the, um, to, to what I'm doing now. Because... Uh, the real lesson of, the, of our period in government after 97 to 2005 is not just about the need to manage uh, migration. It's that when issues of immigration, I don't like the word migrant, it's sort of, it's, it, it's got a pejorative undertone to it. But when the debate about immigration gets confused with the debate about refugees, then you end up in trouble. Because an immigrant is someone who is seeking a better life in another country for fundamentally economic reasons. And a refugee is someone who's fleeing their home country for fundamentally political reasons. One is seeking a better life, the other one is fleeing uh, to save their life. And I mean, this audience is an, doesn't need teaching about fleeing and rebuilding. And I think it's really important for me to try and explain that, yes, there are 250 million migrants around the world, immigrants around the world, would-be immigrants, who are on the move. But there are 65 million refugees or internally displaced people. And uh, the mission of the IRC is to help people whose lives are shattered by conflict and disaster survive, recover, and gain control of their lives. And these are people who are refugees from Syria or from Afghanistan or from South Sudan, from war, essentially. Or they're people internally displaced in northeast Nigeria or in South Sudan from civil conflict. And the one in every 120 per people on the planet is now displaced from their home by conflict. Last year, 24 people a minute were displaced from their homes by conflict. Uh, if this was a country, these 65 million people, the size of Britain, it would be the 21st biggest country in the world. And this is not a problem or a challenge that's going to go away anytime soon because what we know about civil wars is that they carry on for a very long time. Afghanistan, Somalia, Congo then these are 30, 40 year conflicts. Anyone who predicts that the Syria conflict is going to be over in soon really needs to think uh, carefully. And the world has to really come to terms with whether or not it's willing to defend the idea that people who are displaced from their homes by conflict have rights and the international community has responsibilities towards them. Because at the moment, those rights are not being honored and the responsibilities are not being honored either. And so the vast bulk of refugees are being hosted in poor countries and rich countries, at best, are offering to build refugee camps and, at worst, turning a blind eye. So even, I mean, I say this to an American audience with real, uh, and they're pretty shocked, the second closest ally of the United States in the Middle East is Jordan. And Jordan is a country of six, six and a half million people. It's got 650,000 registered refugees. It's got 650,000 more, according to the government, unregistered refugees. So tw effectively a 20% increase in its population. Lebanon. Yes. One in four people is a, is a refugee, just from Syria, never mind Palestinian and uh, Iraqi refugees from previous waves. And we are expecting those countries, but also the Kenyas and the Ethiopias and the Ugandas of this world, also the Pakistans of this world, actually Iran has got 800,000 uh, Afghans in it. Uh, we're expecting those countries to host 
and deliver this global public good of refugee support with an inadequate, threadbare system of international aid. And my point to people is that's morally wrong, but it's also strategically stupid because you're inviting instability in these countries if, then, if, if the refugees are not given a chance to well, What then is the roots. solution? What should richer Western countries be doing, sh short of, or maybe they should be, simply absorbing more of these refugees themselves? Well, we should, but the, I, mean, I, I have no hesitation in saying it, London has taken 97 Syrian refugees this year. You know. So uh, there's no question that the richer parts of the world should take more refugees. But that's always going to be a small, single-digit percentage of the total number of refugees. And so we need a radically different approach to the humanitarian aid system, just in very crude terms. It's got to be an economic system as well as a social support system because the dis displacement is for so long. Mm. It's got to be an urban-based protection and employment system because 59% of refugees are in camps, not in... 59% uh, of refugees are in urban areas, not in camps. It's got to be a system that attends to education as well as health because we're talking about multi-generational displacement. The most tragic thing, I, I've learned so much in this job. I went to the Dadaab refugee camp in eastern Kenya. It's the world's largest refugee camp. It's got 350,000 Somalis in it. And I said to this woman, um, do you think you'll ever go home? Mm. Because that's what you say to Syrians, and it's the only time that they smile when you ask them in Jordan or in Lebanon or in Iran, and they smile. So I said to this woman, do you think you'll ever go home? And she looked at me and she said, she was 25 years old, she said, I was born here. 100,000 Somalis in Dadaab refugee camp were born in a short-term, quote-unquote, emergency refugee camp. Mm. So what better evidence of this fiction of short-termism that is sold to the international community to make emergency aid? We run 480 government grants in our $700 million budget, and the average length is 11 or 12 months. Mm. So long-term problems, short-term Financing. What would a long-term solution look like for these well, people? Where would, they, where would they well, go? A long-term solution is that you say they're not going to be in camps. Uh, they're going to um, be in the countries that they uh, land in, but those countries, it's got to be worth their while. So the World Bank has got to have a radically different approach to countries that may not be poor. Per, you know, Lebanon or Jordan is the best example. They're not poor countries, so traditionally they haven't had World Bank support. <laughs> Now, actually, thanks to the leadership of Jim Kim, it's changed this year. But for the first time, there's World Bank support going into countries like Jordan and Lebanon because of the fragility that comes from the uh, refugee flows. And so it's got to be in the interests of the Kenyas and the Jordans because at the moment, the politics in those countries is the same as the politics here. Anti-refugee. Anti what it's saying in Kenya, the last general election was fought significantly on security concerns about Somali refugees. So unless there is a win-win created, then these countries are going to say, well, we're not going to host these populations for the benefit of the But I just wonder if this, and then we're going to open system. it out, I wonder if maybe the language of hosting them and you saying, well, are you, you know, planning on going home, is actually the part of the problem. You have to, if, given what you just said, dispense with the fiction that they're going home and actually make new cities and new well, lives, new routes. I'm afraid that that's exactly what I've the said. The grandparents in the shop in Livingston Road. No, you know, I mean, new the, routes. The, 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 uh, the fiction is convenient, but fundamentally... Um, a betrayal because it's not the true. It's not true to the to the Western donor populations. And it's not true to the local hosting populations. Now, you've got to make it very worthwhile to countries to think that they'll house people in urban areas. They'll become residents. Query that they'll become citizens. One way you do that is through international aid. One way you do that is through economic support. Because remember, these countries have got needs of their own. In the in that the the, the morbidity rates outside the Dadaab refugee camp among Kenyans are higher yeah. than inside the camp among Somalis. And they're, they're not great amongst the Somalis inside. So it's a huge deal that has to be done. But these people are not going home to Somalia. And in large numbers, they're not going to be coming to Western countries, however much we improve the refugee resettlement effort, which I think we should. And you'd be saying to Western countries, it's in your interest to stabilize... Uh, well, I mean, the, what's interesting in Europe is that Europe has now recognized that, too late in some ways, but the European Union has recognized, and the 28 countries still, uh, have recognized that actually it's going to lap up on European shores if you ignore this problem. So the choice is, do we have illegal undocumented, chaotic, and deathly flight to Europe, or do we have organized, legal, 
routes to hope for a certain number of people and proper support for those who stay behind. And that's, uh, I think, a, a choice with only one answer. And one of the features of the global interconnected world is that these people, in the end, will come here if we don't give them any reason to stay. Yeah. Let's, uh, there's lots more I could ask you, but let's open it up and see what people want to ask David. Um, I'm sure we've got some microphones around. We do. So we've got a hand up here. I don't know if we, if we can get the microphone all the way down here. Why don't, well, okay, well, why don't, you're coming here, so we, let's have, are there any hands over there while we've got somebody with a microphone? Anyone in that little zone? In, not, in that case, why don't you come down here and there's a lady here. So we'll hear your question first, and then we'll go to you, and I'm going to take two or three and we'll take it from there. Yes? I'd like to ask you about the Labour Party. Is it working? Yes, loud and clear, yeah. The Labour Party. Um, Next question. Your, <laughs> you knew it was coming. <laughs> what are your feelings about it? now that many people are saying it's unelectable for at least a generation under its current leadership. And do you believe that Jeremy Corbyn, who I saw on this stage just a few months ago as well at his uh, hustings, do you believe that he has a problem with uh, anti-Semitism personally and within the party? Okay. Let's, um, who's got the microphone next? Over here, I think, somebody. Yeah. Sorry, do you want my question now? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. I'm just looking for the next one. I'm I was always just, planning ahead. Yeah. Just wondering how we're going to square the um, yeah. practical uh, solutions of refugees within Europe or coming to Europe when there is such a rise in the white, right-wing parties in, in countries such as um, Hungary um, and Greece as well and, and other countries too in Belgium, I think. Um, that there is this, this huge rise in the right wing, and how on earth do you get a consensus within Europe to, to get a move of, a, a fair move of, of uh, refugees? Thank you, and we've got one more here. Yeah. Um, you mentioned before that everything is now up for grabs, everything is open in terms of political campaigning, it's all transparent. Political discourse has really frightened me, the Brexit campaign and the American election campaign, things have been said which, were unthinkable as being said in public in the past. Things have been done. Political violence has become much more common. Is there any pullback from that, or are we simply going to go further down the path of violence, both in language and in deed? Mm. I mean, that worries me a lot, that question, Henry. Because when depths are plumbed, it's very hard to unplumb them. That, uh, that, that worries me a lot. That if the, when the spectrum of, um, I don't like to say respectable, but um, legitimate, or mm. that's not the right word either, but when, when the spectrum of um, conventional discourse stretches so far, then uh, it's very hard to see how you pull it back. And that speaks to broken bonds and to uh, a fear that the centre can't hold it. And it relates, obviously, to the second uh, question I was asked. You don't have to look even to Austria. You can look at France. I mean, uh, there's, a, you know, there's, a, uh, there's a real uh, fight to be had uh, about what it means to be French and what it means to have a modern France, really. Um, but, I, but in terms of the second question, Britain, Britons and Americans are also in no huge hurry to receive large numbers of no, refugees either. No, I think that the... This is where the immigration refugee confusion or uh, elision has become so uh, damaging. Because actually, if you say to people, the, the government have taken 4,000 refugees a year, they've said for, to the UK, which is six per parliamentary constituency, uh, it's always useful to bring it down to that level. Uh, I always say to people, no one is going to persuade me that six refugees in South Shields is going to overwhelm the constituency, and people can, can get that. Now, I think it's also very important that... Um, we allow refugees to speak for themselves because, look, let me say to this audience, we don't, we don't need to go searching for the sons and daughters, the grandsons and granddaughters of refugees who have been extraordinary citizens of this and other countries. I think that's really important. Uh, Elie Wiesel said to me, uh, refugees may be unpopular, but refuge isn't. And he said, go, he was one of our board of overseers. He said to me before he died, he said, Go and defend refuge, because that's actually, people understand that, and that speaks to the, the, this notion that a refugee is someone who's living, who's, who's in fear, and it's a job to provide refuge. But you're, it seems to me that you have to fight the hard right 
by ensuring that there is a sufficient stake in the system for the population. And that's where the, uh, the inequalities of globalization, or driven by, in, by globalization, I think are, are, are really serious. And if you don't address them, then whatever you do on refugees is not gonna make, is not gonna mm. do the trick one way or the other. And the truth about France, let's be honest, is not about current refugee flows, it's about 30 or 40 years of uh, integration that hasn't worked very well. Um, what about on this first question yes, about Labour? I can't quite remember I what that question was. <laughs> the, uh, look, my feelings of... Uh, is Labour unelectable yeah, look, for my, another generation? My, and uh, does Corbyn uh, have yeah, a yeah, problem? Yeah, yeah. I, I remember, I remember, I remember No, no, the, I think you should answer I rem it. Yes, I know I should answer it, and I, I'm very happy to answer it, and I'm not, not trying to dodge it. Um, look, my feelings about the position of the Labour Party are of great distress. If you, you ask what my feelings are, um, to see Labour this far from power is very distressing. Uh, I, the fact that we are probably now further from power than we have been since the 1930s is very distressing to me. What's also very distressing to me is that 10 years ago, less than 10 years ago, we'd won three elections on the trot and on gay rights or on overseas aid or on commitment to the National Health Service, uh, the new conservative leadership was having to realign itself towards a uh, centre-left position. Hmm. So I feel that grievously. I don't feel any, I, 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 as I said earlier about in another context, none of us are innocent in this. And it's a, it, it's a um, very striking feature of the modern uh, environment to see a government that is um, struggling to come to terms with what, with the meaning of the referendum vote, but to have people feel that um, uh, Labour is unelectable. Now, I wrote in the New Statesman uh, last, in, uh, in uh, the end of September, so anyone who's a journalist here, this is not a new line, um, I, I said uh, in the New Statesman, uh, Labour's problem is not that it's undesirable to be unelectable. Labour's problem is that in too many ways it's unelectable because it's undesirable, which is a different point. And the argument that I think has to be made inside the Labour Party is a, a fundamental one about its purpose, its values, its mission, and its uh, orientation. And I never thought I'd see the day when, Labour had to, when we had to discuss whether or not Labour was rife or, uh, I don't know what exact word you use, but the idea that labor and anti-Semitism are in the same sentence is a shocking state of uh, affairs. And I think that it's very important to say that uh, there's evidently been a problem and that it needs to be addressed. And that the job of tackling anti-Semitism is not just for Jews, it's a job that applies to all of us. Because we all know that when Jews are targeted, uh, all sorts of other minorities are gonna be targeted as well. And it's very, very important that we stand up about that. And it pains me to have to, to even think that we're debating it. In, in 2020, could you look this or any other audience in the eye and urge them to vote and make Jeremy Corbyn Prime Minister? Well, I think that the tragedy is that the um, Labour's chances of forming the government mean that the question at the next election that is going to confront us is whether or not Labour's in a position to be a fighting opposition or not. And that is a tragic state of affairs. But should he be Prime Minister? What do you mean? Should Jeremy Corbyn be Prime Minister? I, I, don't, I, I think I'm going to urge people to vote Labour, if that's what you're asking. I, think it's, I, think that I, I will certainly say that people should vote Labour. I think that the, um, uh, the idea that we become a, uh, effectively a one-party state, I think, is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Let's take another round, and I'm going to sort of move upward, because it's not fair to people who are not sitting down here. Um, there's a hand there in the middle row. Yes, keep your hand up while we get... And why don't we get a microphone there as well, if we can? And um, let's see if there's a third one after that. I'm only, put, oh, there we are. There's a lady up there. Can you keep holding that thing up and then we'll know to come to you? Yes. Let's start whoever's got the microphone first. Yes. I'd like to ask, Ooh, I'm, I'm over here, by the way. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask I'm whether okay. you have any plans to return to the United Kingdom in the near future and whether you had any plans to return to Labour Party politics, specifically as a politician in the near future. Okay, and uh, yeah, you were waiting. Um, yes, uh, David, I, I was a headmaster of the City of London School for 15 years, which um, 
has um, 30, was 38 percent Jewish and Muslim, 25 percent Jewish, 13 percent Muslim. And one of the things I used to say to the boys, and I think it's a very destructive um, element within the UK, is the role of the press. And if I could just read very quickly um, what Richard Kavanagh and the Sun said just before the Iraq War: History teaches a simple lesson. Appeasing a tyrant is never the answer. Thankfully, Winston Churchill grasped this in the last century, so now does Tony Blair. In this testing time for his leadership, we back him all the way. Roll forward after the Chilcot inquiry, and the same uh, Trevor Kavanagh says, Tony Blair's legacy, inflicting a terrorist firestorm on a fragile and unstable world. And, um, you know, the, 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 um, the, the, the news of the world accused him of, um, of being insane under the under the heading that it was a delusion. Now, what I, what I would like to ask is a comment to you, because I used to say to the boys, success has many fathers, failure has only one. And secondly, before you consider a public career, I would ask you to look very carefully at the role of the media, because they will bludgeon you into taking actions, and they'll hang you out to dry if anything goes wrong. And you might be better off having a successful business career or professional career, and then giving, giving your time and your energy and your money to philanthropy and charity. Can you comment? May I just say, Andrew Adonis, a good friend of mine, symp was sympathetic but disagreed vehemently. All right, thank you. I'm not going to shut up a head teacher. I'd get, get into much trouble. <laughs> he, he could have gone on for another half an hour. I wouldn't have stopped him. Who, who's the next one with the microphone? Uh, lady there, yes. Yeah, it, it, same question. I do want to get a third one in, but I'm quite keen to get a bit of a gender balance. That's why I'm ignoring all these men with their hands up. There we are. Woman at the back there. Keep your hand up, and we'll get the microphone up to you. See, if you ask somebody from The Guardian to do this, this is what you're going to get. Um, there we are. We'll hear from this woman at the back, and then we will bring it back to David. Yes. Thank you. Um, yes. How do we change the narrative that uh, refugees are somehow illiterate criminals um, or other um, uh, uncomfortable labels that people seem to be putting on them and some, some elements of the press. Um, and secondly, uh, what can we as citizens and individuals do to help refugees, if anything? Great. Um, Give me that first, I think. Yeah, Thank I think, you, that, we'll I think that the, uh, the narrative um, needs to be changed by, in part by refugees themselves that it's very hard to give people voice unless they're using their own voices. And um, certainly our experience in the US, we run, we're an unusual organization in that we're an international humanitarian aid organization, but we're also a refugee resettlement agency in 29 US cities. And we're now giving advice around Europe about how successful refugee integration can take place. And what we find is that uh, the, however toxic the environment, when a refugee actually moves in next door to you, in the US, the compassion, the outreach, the who's my new neighbor comes out very, very strongly. And I think, one, we have to do a far better job at getting refugee voices out. Secondly, people who are not refugees have to be willing to support them. So Mandy Patinkin did a, uh, went to Lesvos uh, with us, and within eight days, four and a half million people had watched the video that he uh, produced. And it, it's important to have that kind of testimonial, I think there's also a job of political leadership. And what all of us can do is make sure that our political leaders know that there is a constituency waiting and expecting and urging them to speak up in a way that does justice to uh, these people. Now, it's nice to be able to be in the, UK, in the US and say, well, Britain is a country where on a cross-party basis there's a commitment to our responsibilities on international overseas aid. So, uh, strike. I think when you say to an American audience 0.21% of your national income goes in overseas aid, the UK is 0.7%, it's survived austerity, da -da -da -da. Uh, but it's, uh, the UK situation is obviously a curate's egg because in respect, no one in America knows what a curate's egg is, by the way, <laughs> I've discovered that, but the, uh, the other half of the equation is that uh, the, uh, the refugee resettlement story is a much, is a much weaker story. Mm. And I think we've got, to, you can only change the narrative from the bottom up and the top down at the same time, and it's it's very important to do so. My own perspective is that people who say, well, why is there a backlash against refugees? It's not as simple as that. There's a, there's a polarization, I think, because for every person who is fearful, there's also someone who's willing to stand up and say, well, hang on, th these are people. And the biggest problem we face as an organization is that the numbers seem so large that two things happen. One, people think they can't make a difference. And two, that the 65 million people get dehumanized. And I would specify our job as rehumanizing this 
population. These are people with names and lives, some of them middle class people who do jobs like anyone else in this hall, but who've been tipped out of their own country by barrel bombs from their own government. On exactly the, at this point, I just want to hear your reaction to this. I interviewed the Israeli novelist David Grossman last mm. week uh, and to be published in a week or two's time. He said the problem is this word refugee. He said these people aren't refugees. They are a dentist or professor or nurse who had to seek refuge. And the minute you hear their story and they become a person like you, then you can empathize. The minute when they're refugees, it's a vast, undifferentiated mass, and it, it prevents human empathy, it's which good, I thought was an interesting That's a nice way of putting it. Um, the other, two, more, two other questions were asked. One of the, but, well, from the head teacher, we asked about the role of the media. And, uh, but look, the media... He, I thought he was going to say he d to discouraged his pupils from becoming journalists. He discouraged them even from becoming he discouraged politicians them from becoming because politicians. of the media. So um, I, I, look, I said to the people in my office last week that the degree of commitment they felt to politics was something they should honour. The fact that the grief that they felt was not something to be ashamed of. It was actually something to honour because of, it reflected a commitment to their own country, never mind the wider world. And I, I think that uh, it's a very sad day when the media scare people off politics, but some people are scared off politics by uh, the, uh, the venom that is associated with public life. Now, the truth is that the media is no longer confined to newspapers. I mean, the media is all around us in a whole swirling torrent of craziness. And that's why the thing, control the media, it's, it's, a, it's a much bigger question about where discussion and discourse happen and what are the common points of reference for that discussion. I would say on that, however vicious the mainstream media has ever been, it is nothing compared to the viciousness that is doled out by individuals to other individuals on social yeah. media. Um, yeah. You know, that is, the, you can't hold a candle yeah. to that. The questioner uh, there asked about you and your yeah, own no, plans, so look, and I'm, are you I'm, coming back? And I'm running a, an organization that's in the midst of a global storm, and there are people here from the organization, and I'm committed to that organization. I'm doing work that is not finished, and as long as I feel I'm having an impact on the issues I care about and the people who I care about, doing the job that I'm doing, it would just be wrong to start speculating about what I'm gonna do next. And I'm flattered by the interest and the concern. But I feel we've got a, an extraordinary mission. Uh, we've got a, a real vision, not just of how a $700 million organization with 13,000 employees and 10,000 volunteers standing on the shoulders of Albert Einstein can make a difference itself. We also have a vision how $26 billion of a global overseas aid system that isn't working very well in humanitarian settings gets changed. Mm. And we are setting out to exemplify the best of an outcome-oriented, evidence-based, value-for-money, innovative charity that gains strength from being focused. We're not in 120 countries, we're in 30 countries because we're focused on people whose lives are shattered by crisis. We have a responsibility to be an operational leader, but we also have a responsibility to be a thought leader for the rest of the sector. And that, I feel, is a mission that engages me, and it, it, frankly, I feel I'm making more difference doing that than I would be doing anything else at the moment, and it's important to see that through. Is there anything about being here that you missed? <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, well, What do you miss about being here? Well, uh, yeah, this is my country. I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm proud to be British. I'm, uh, I miss uh, my friends, obviously. Um, I miss my mum. You know, uh, I've been to see my mum this afternoon. Um, so pandering to a the, Jewish uh, audience. <laughs> <laughs> so pandering. So yes, I think it's. I think um, the point is that you don't get any action replays in life, and you don't. You, although you can play it in your mind, you don't get. Uh, you don't get a chance to play it over, and you only live it once, or at least I think you only live it once. And so the uh, the experience that we've got is one that we're living in real time. And you know, we've got two boys who are growing up. Um, my wife, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a whole um, set of emotions going that go with being, quote unquote, back. Yes. Um, and it's just important to be honest about that. Very good. We've got probably five minutes left because we've, we've overrun a bit. Let's take a last couple of questions. And, uh, and I know there's lots of fans. I'm not going to be able to get you all in. But uh, you're very near there. So why don't we go to this man here? And I am going to, again, see if I can find a woman to answer or ask a question. But I can't at the moment. So we're going to hear from you. Is there, so there we are. So we'll come here after you. Go on, let's hear from you first and we'll bring the microphone down here. Yeah. Good evening. Um, like many people in this room, I presume I was appalled by Brexit. 
but I can't help thinking, listening to you speak in the articulate way that you do, that if you had been the leader of the Labour Party, we would not be having Brexit today. Do you think, do you think about that at night? Let's have three more questions, please. We'll go to you here. Yeah. Yeah. You talk about the glass ceiling being too thick for Hillary Clinton. Would you not say that Theresa May is precariously balanced on the glass cliff? <laughs> and there was somebody very near you had a hand up. Why don't we just pass it to this lady here, and this will be the last one. Yeah. Sorry to other people who couldn't get in. Yeah. Um, as a Labour activist for 56 years, I'm a bit worried about your... Um, in reverse complacency about whether uh, Jeremy Corbyn could become prime minister. After all, who would have given a ch an idea that he would have, that Trump would have won, or indeed that Jeremy Corbyn two years ago, who would have thought Jeremy Corbyn could be the leader of the Labour Party? So I'm a bit worried that we're slipping into a reverse complacency. You mean and you what, think he could win? I think he could win. And do you want him to win? No. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. It's the 56 like, years uh, Labour member thing that slightly yeah. wrong footed me. So um, I, want, I want Chaka Muna or I want uh, Dan Jarvis or Keir Starmer is my person for it. But I would like a Labour victory, but I don't want Jeremy question. Corbyn as Prime Minister. Does anybody have a question about refugees for <laughs> David? That's the thing. Okay, you've got your hand up. Why don't you take the microphone here and we're going to, you'll, you'll gather the answers for all these. Yes. Uh, so on refugees, yes. how do you make refugees no longer the issue of just charities or individuals? How do you incentivise businesses or those who've got a purely profit motive to make it interesting? How do you engage people in social purpose? Okay, that's very nice. Interesting. Why don't you pick up that one and then you can... Um... Well, let me end with that one. I mean, the... Um... Well, in that case, there, you're going to have to do the other ones first then. That yeah, so... Uh... So why don't we do Theresa May on the glass cliff? I think meaning sort of precariousness, she's in a bit of a mess. Yeah. Um, look, the... Uh, she's probably... She, she, she'll be... Uh pretty surprised about how the year has ended. Um, and I think the only person more surprised will be David Cameron. Uh, and uh, um, it shows you that um, political commitments made in tactical haste can come back to haunt you in strategic depth. You're talking about the promise to have a referendum. Yeah, and the, look, but it, it goes back deep. The, the promise to leave the European People's Party yeah. in 2006, um, the distance that then arose from Mrs. Merkel and the rest of the European centre-right, the uh, way in which that just um, contributed to this sense of always battling against Britain. My former colleague Jim Murphy, who some of you will know, had this very powerful way of saying that uh, Britain's tragedy has always been into the, in, in the, the tyranny of what he called the double negative in the debate about Europe, which is, Europe's about to do something terrible, but don't worry, it's not going to affect us. <laughs> and that's not a good way of making the pro-European <laughs> argument. And I think that, um, so I, I don't know what uh, Theresa May is going to be uh, thinking. I thought she'll be, she'll be pretty pleased come the end of the year. I don't, so so I, don't, I, don't, I don't, she doesn't feel teetering to me. What worries me is that the economic hit related to Brexit will become evident long before the pol politics of Brexit is resolved. And that creates a dangerous window where it is by no means certain that people will think they made a mistake in voting for Brexit. They could equally double down on what I perceive to be the mistake that they made. And that's very, very uh, dangerous. I think that... Um, so... Uh, I don't so do you stay up at night rethinking? I don't. Might I, don't, I, don't I don't. I don't. I don't believe in a great man theory of history, and I don't um, have sleepless nights. Um, and or at least I always fall asleep easily. I sometimes wake up in the middle of the night, but I fall asleep easily. Um, and uh, I think it's important not to torture oneself with uh, questions of what might have been. We've got more than enough to do uh, today to keep us more than busy, and so that's what I try to uh, focus on. And it's, it feels a bit early to be. Um, uh, narrating my own memoirs. Um, the uh, just on um, let me let me finish up on the uh, the sort of cause of the yes. uh, moment because I think I feel this very strongly and I haven't quite found a way to 
articulate it. So I need, I'm going to need your help with this, but I think this is important. So when we think about the International Rescue Committee, we think about the work that we do around the world to help people who are going to die because they are suffering ill health in the midst of conflict. There are people in Syria who are dependent today on the IRC for their health care. Eight of our hospitals have been bombed, did I say that earlier, in uh, the Syria conflict yeah. in the course of 2016. Uh, eight hospitals that we run and uh, support. Uh, there, I was in Myanmar last month, and there are women and kids who are dependent on us for protection and for the reunification of their families. Um, I'm going to Jordan, and I'm going to be discussing there an employment project, an empl a big employment plan to get refugees into work, to take advantage of tariff-free access to European markets. Those are acts of rescue that we are very, very proud of, and which really need the commitment of the private sector, the, the gentleman asked about, because I think the private sector is ready to go from a rhetoric and reality of so-called corporate social responsibility to embrace an ethos and ethic of corporate social results, because one of the things that, we're, that I always say about uh, the course of the IRC at the moment is that we're moving, we've always had a big heart, but we're also going to have a hard head, and we're not afraid to talk about value for money, because if we put more money into things that work, then we're going to do more good for more people. And the corporate social results that we um, seek will only be achieved if we have new kinds of partnerships with the private sector for a very simple reason. We get paid by governments, 85% of our $700 million comes from governments, we get paid by governments to deliver programs. But no one pays us to exist. No one pays us to run a legal function. No one pays us to run an HR function so that we don't employ uh, the wrong kind of people. No one pays us to run proper finance and IT systems. Uh, no one pays us to do marketing. We'll spend less than 2% of our budget on marketing and communications. Private sector organizations around the world have got massive expertise, capacity, ability to contribute to that. IRC UK is here. You don't have to think about, you don't have to get on a plane to New York to contribute. You'll get on the way out details of IRC UK which has got a really committed and dedicated team here that oversees the whole of our European operations. It's our European hub. We've got operations in Germany, in uh, Belgium, in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, so there's real ways in which the private sector can contribute to that corporate social results. But here's the point that I think is interesting and that I want to try and develop, and I haven't quite found the poetry to do so, but uh, Jonathan, you can uh, help, me, help me do so in due course. And that is that we're actually trying to rescue something about our own societies as well as about people far away whose names we don't know. We're trying to rescue an ethic that says someone who lives on the other side of the world, whose name you don't know, uh, has a depth of humanity which it's our obligation to honor. And I don't need to belabor the point to, uh, to this audience, but I think it's a point about our mm. societies that when Albert Einstein set up the IRC, he did so to rescue Jews from Europe. But he always hoped that we would become an organization. And by the way, we were set up to rescue Jews, but we rescued gay intellectuals in the course of the Second World War, as well as Jews. So it, wasn't, it was not confined. We were a secular organization, not, a, uh, not confined in our humanity. And those ideals that says you owe something to strangers, not just to neighbors, is a really deep idea, not just of Judaism or of other faiths, it's a deep idea of Western societies. Not just Western societies, it's a universal idea of some societies, but it's certainly an idea that I think has helped make societies like this one and societies like the US great. But as we've discussed tonight, those ideals are actually under threat. And that very notion of what you owe to people who are different from you, not just people who are the same as you. There's a brilliant chapter in Jonathan Sachs' new uh, book of last year about uh, love strangers, don't just love neighbors. Uh, there's a fundamental idea there that we have to rescue and hold and burnish and develop. And I think that that's a message that is really, really important because those are ideals that actually make these societies worth defending. And so we're doing the, the work we do. I think it isn't just about them. It's also about us. And if that's something that we take away from this evening, then I think it'll be well spent. So thank you very much.